Welcome to Radical AI, a podcast about radical ideas, radical people, and radical stories at the intersection of ethics and artificial intelligence. We are your hosts, Dylan and Jess. Just as a reminder for all of our episodes, while we love interviewing people who fall far from the norm and interrogating radical ideas, we do not necessarily endorse the views of our guests on this show. In this episode, we interview Karen Howe, the artificial intelligence reporter for the MIT Technology Review. Karen covers the ethics and social impacts of technology, as well as its applications for social good. She also writes the AI newsletter, The Algorithm, which thoughtfully examines the field's latest news and research. Previously, Karen was a reporter and data scientist at Quartz and an application engineer at the first startup to spin out of Google X. A few of the topics that we cover in this interview include how can journalism bridge the gap between technology and public policy? How do we effectively explain complex AI systems to policymakers? How are the fields of journalism and AI surprisingly similar? And how do we measure truth in journalism? It is our pleasure to share with you all this interview with Karen Howe. Well, Karen, first, uh, we just want to welcome you to the show and thank you for taking the time today to come and talk with us. Thank you so much for having me. And why don't you start us off by telling us a little bit more about you and not just as a researcher, but in life and really what makes you tick? Um, a little bit about me. Well, I grew up in New Jersey <laughs> um, and lived a very suburban childhood. So I think I am naturally kind of introverted and I like uh, many of the activities that I do in my free time involve small groups of people and lots of just reflection and quiet time. <laughs> um, also, I'm just a very philosophical person. So uh, I think the things that make me tick are like big, hairy questions that I like to just sit and think about or talk with my friends about for long periods of time about like, why is society the way that it is? How can we make it better? Is it possible to make it better? <laughs> like what, what kinds of systems should we be thinking about constructing to uh, facilitate like higher quality of life among human beings? Um, so yeah, I, um, that, I guess like that's my <laughs> personal background. And then in my actual day job, I am the senior artificial intelligence reporter at MIT Technology Review. And um, one thing that I really love about my job is the fact that I get to, um, AI is just such an expansive topic and it is actually quite a philosophical topic. And so um, I found my happy place in getting to think about these questions and also get paid for it. One thing that I, I love about your um, s journalism is, um, that it seems to be able to push some buttons. Like you really get to the heart of some matters. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just like talk about how you view your role as a journalist in the AI space and especially the AI ethics space. Yeah. Well, one of the things that inspired me to go to into journalism in the first place, um, because so I actually studied mechanical engineering in college and journalism was a bit of a swerve for me, but um, the reason why it really attracted me is because I really care a lot about um, educating people about technology and the way that technology is shaping society like in, in a way that prepares them, but also um, challenging the way that technology is made or created today and the way that tech companies operate today. Um, and I see my role as a person who bridges the conversations between like the, the the conversations that happen in SF versus DC I suppose is like the shorthand way of saying it but um like I think oftentimes when you're hearing conversations it's there's like two different spheres of conversation that happen it's like the ones among technologists just talking about the technical details of how something is made and the ones among policymakers who don't necessarily always understand how a technology works and are just kind of mystified by it all um and 
my personal theory of change is that technology is a very powerful force, but neither for good nor for evil. It's very much based on the way that we use it and the way that we allow it to shape our lives. Um, and so in order to have it actually benefit lots of people, you need to have policymakers, regulators, um, citizens that are holding it accountable and holding companies who are creating it accountable um, to the, the things that we, the outcomes that we actually want to see. And so I think that's probably why I am willing to kind of just say things the way that I feel um, they should be said in, in when I cover AI ethics, because I just think it's so important to get it right because AI is, it moves really fast and it, it um, the scale is so big that if you don't get it right, it's kind of hard to turn the ship around. And one of the, um, one of my favorite articles of yours is the Amazon is the invisible backbone of ICE's immigration crackdown article, which I just thought was an incredibly powerful piece. And it also, uh, as you said, challenges some um, some assumptions, depending on where you're seated, but it, it connects the political to the technological. Um, and based on my experience on Twitter and other places, that can kind of, uh, that can cause some blowback sometimes. And I'm wondering if you've experienced that, uh, some reactions to your work that you may not have been expecting. Yeah, totally. Um, I get blowback Actually, I get less blowback than I expect, which is probably a good thing. Um, one thing that's really amazing about, I think, MIT Technology Review readers is the caliber of engagement from readers, um, which is not necessarily the case of other places that I've worked at before, where the blowback is much more superficial and much more um, vitri vitriolic. But at Tech Review, most of the time when people are pushing back on my stuff, they actually have like really legitimate critiques that I think are important for me to um, read and understand and respond to. And I find it helpful um, when I receive these types of comments to, it, it's a way for me to get keep a pulse on how people are thinking about things and what are like the common arguments against my arguments so that I can refine my own and um, put out, do better work to um, strengthen my position, essentially. Based off of your history in journalism, and now that you've really started to bring some of these stories to light, what is the relationship and really the intersection between AI, really AI ethics, and storytelling, and how can they help each other out? I think ethics is all about storytelling and that um, you need, uh, well, I guess this goes back to another th theory or philosophy of mine, which is I think everything fundamentally is storytelling. In order to have an idea gain traction, you have to build a narrative around it and everything that we understand as people and the way that we make sense of the world is all through narratives as well, whether that happens consciously or subconsciously. Um, I just firmly believe that like, that's how we understand the world is through narratives. So if you, in, in the AI ethics space, if you are trying to have a particular idea or value system um, take hold, or if you're, if you're trying to communicate a value system, um, it's all about storytelling it in the right way, like picking the right um, characters to really bring to life the ideas that you're um, you're trying to communicate. I don't know if that that makes sense, but but yeah, like I think storytelling is just core to any kind of communication. And with AI ethics, communication is so crucial that storytelling is inherently just um, part of that. Absolutely. And uh, based, based on my own experience, I guess, um, storytelling is also how we shape the world and how we shape who we are. And so for me, why I started getting into justice work in general was a very particular experience I had uh, in India at a, in a resettlement colony. Um, and I'm wondering for you if there was a particular like catalyst moment that set you on this path. Um, not AI ethics in particular, but I think the catalyst moment that really made me realize how important storytelling is um, was when I was at uh, the first company I ever worked at, it was a, um, a startup in San Francisco that had, it was actually the first startup to spin out of Google X. And I was there as an engineer. And um, 
in a startup environment, you get to wear lots of different hats and you're always like trying, like I was technically an engineer, but then I was like writing blog posts and like managing the social media and like doing all this stuff. And, um, I think one of the things that really struck me was the CEO was such an amazing storyteller, the the founder CEO. He just like had such a way with communicating what the startup was about that he could raise like tons of money and get people to care about it and then get people to work for him and all these things. And um, at the same time, also like me managing the social media accounts, managing the blog and all of that made me also realize how important that work was like without that work no one cares what you're building because they can't relate to it they don't know about it um, and they won't therefore attach value to it and so that was like a pivotal moment for me in realizing oh actually like I think if I really want to make an impact um, on the world maybe I should lean more into the storytelling aspect of things because that is what actually changes hearts now that we've sufficiently all said storytelling probably a hundred times in the last 15 minutes, uh, I'm going to say it one more time. Do you have a favorite story that you have told or come across while you've been a part of this work? I don't know. It's hard to pick like a favorite, but I think a story that I'm particularly proud of is uh, I did this interactive in, I think, October of last year that took me over or almost a year to put together, but it's about the criminal justice system and um, algorithmic bias through the through this particular case study of algorithms used in the criminal justice system. And um, for me, it was kind of like the epitome of a lot of the things that I care about, like synthesizing how technical details can then lead to impacts on people's lives and not just the individual, but like create systemic injustices um and it was doing it in an engaging way that allowed people to kind of in, uh, work through pretty complicated topics um like algorithmic bias is a thing that has become like really hot these days but um it's there's like a lot of nuance behind it and um i was proud of actually doing that piece and giving people a way into this complexity um, and into understanding like all, all of the ways that different things in the system work together. So I am also coming from a, a technical computer science background and something that I've been really passionate in my work is finding a way to take really technical ideas, especially ones like machine learning and artificial intelligence, and um, trying to make them translatable to people who don't have that technical background. I know that based off of looking at some of the projects you've done on your website, you have also done work in this space as well. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about how that's translated and then also what motivated you to do that? So I think I actually, so I haven't been in AI for very long. Like I've only been covering it for one and a half years. And before that I was not covering AI at all or following the space. And that actually came to my advantage um, when I first started because I was coming to it with a technical background, but not in with the expertise. And so I had like a completely beginner's mind um, in understanding the subject. And when it, so there's two pieces that I've, that I've done that have been like the most resonant to, um, audiences. And they were just flow charts, like me drawing out what different concept concepts meant. And I actually drew those like only a month into covering the space as a way for me to help understand, um, what I was about to get myself into essentially. And, um, in that way, I still had the experience of like my own confusion to help guide me in thinking like, how do I actually explain this to someone else who is maybe just a month behind and trying to enter this um, as well? So so it was kind of actually by accident that um, I was able to strike the right balance between, between um, com communicating enough of the technical detail, but also being, uh, helping like a, the lay person understand things. Um, yeah, so that, that it, 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 it's funny. It's kind of funny, like how some things that you spend like very little time on, on end up being like the thing that blows up. But, um, 
that's kind of like the backstory behind those two articles. One of the things I think is uh, particularly powerful and also unique in a lot of ways about your journalism is that you are unafraid to bring in questions of race and gender and identity. And I'm curious about how you navigate uh, your own identity in this space. Yeah, well, um, I th- yeah. So I think one of the reasons why I bring race and identity into my work all the time is because the these are things that I think about constantly. Like as an Asian woman, um, when I was in tech, that I was like one of a few women. When I'm in journalism, I'm one of a few Asians. So like I'm always thinking about like it's just part of my day-to-day experience that like this, my identity just is, I don't know, it's, it's like pervasive in like everything that I do. Um, and so that, that's kind of, I I don't know, I don't know if I even subconsciously, or I don't, I don't know if I consciously put this into my work. I think it's subconscious because it is my own lived experience. And so it, and, and this is, I guess, also informs a lot of like how I think about AI because um, I guess one of the conversations that's now really happening in AI is like the fact that people who are building it, their own identities automatically are embedded in the work that they do as well. And for me, that's kind of like an obvious thing because I guess maybe like growing up as someone who always had the outsider's perspective. I was like, duh, like as the outsider, of course, I'm going to think differently from you and make different things from you. Um, And so I guess that's one of the things that I also care about highlighting a lot when I write about AI is the importance of people recognizing that um, we have identities that we bring into our work. One of the things that also like I think about a lot is there's actually a lot of parallel between journalism and AI (laughs) in that like journalism for a very long time was a pretty white male dominated field. And the overarching narrative of journalism was that you were objective. And like, I have never believed this myth. Like, I don't think anyone can be objective and seeing AI kind of like the field starting to grapple with like the same questions of like, oh, we thought algorithms were objective. And we thought like the people who were building it were just writing objective code is kind of entertaining to me. (laughs) That like, that like journalists kind of went through this and the journalism industry is still kind of like messed up and we're still trying to figure things out. But like now the AI industry is going through this and like at some, hopefully someday people will realize that there's no such thing as objectivity and everything Um, everything that you produce as a human is processed through your lived experience. What do you think that the role that um, objectivity and this idea that uh, things are neutral can play in harmful consequences on society, both in journalism and the spread of misinformation, for example, and AI and uh, the spread of technologies that we think are neutral but are actually harming people? (laughs) Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, the harmful, in both instances, I think the harmful thing is that um, if if people genuinely believe in like the objectivity myth, you end up not scrutinizing things as much. Um, So like in journalism, I, people talk about how like winners always get to write history. And if, if, if you, if you actually believed that like the record of a particular event were objective, you wouldn't scrutinize all the gaps in it. Um, You wouldn't look to see what's missing or how things are portrayed um, falsely perhaps. Like, um, and I think that one of the, like journalists are always about like finding truth or whatever, like truth is consensus formation. It's, it's not, there's no like inherent universal truth that we're all like, trying to like wipe the dusty windshield off to peer into. Um, It's about like how, I guess like the the majority of people um, agree on like a particular sequence of events or whatever. Um, So that's journalism. And then with AI, it's the same thing. Like if you believe an algorithm is objective, you don't scrutinize or challenge its decisions when they're made. And like in the criminal justice example, this is actually happening a lot where um, a lot of uh, precincts are starting to turn to these tools, believing that it is more objective than a human judge. 
which it's not really. It's just automating a particular perspective. So whereas a judge might have different feelings on different days that affect their decisions, the algorithm, like wh whoever made the algorithm, that perspective at that moment is like fossilized. And then it just keeps automating that particular perspective again and again. And um, whereas you as a defendant might understand how to challenge a human judge and understand that they are subjective and that there's like room for disagreement, you might not have the same transparency into an algorithm and might not know how to actually challenge its decision if you wanted to. So you lose that sense of like agency and um, transparency in the process. So I think that's how it harms people like the narrative of objectivity is how that harms people is is that you just lose the ability to actually shape things um or disagree with things so we're living in an era where i'll say out in the media world there's this narrative that perhaps we're living in a post-truth world or we're inundated with fake news and i'm wondering uh because, you know, I'm a philosophy nerd, this concept of truth is really interesting to me. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could address that critique that we're living in a post-truth world. So again, like if, in, if there were such a thing as a post-truth world, that means that there was also at one point a thing where truth existed, which is not true. Like what, what has actually happened is before there were a lot more gatekeepers who got to say what they wanted about like what was happening in the world. Um, and journalists included, like journalism is like, a, the media is like a huge gatekeeper and there used to be um, much more stringent. Uh, there, the, who, got, who got access to media companies was like a whole thing. And um, the gatekeepers were a lot less diverse and therefore there was this perception that there was a truth because most people agreed with one another. Um, and now what's happening is there's more of a democratic, um, hopefully more, more democracy online. There's like more people that are writing um, opinions that they're putting on social media or like on their blogs or whatever. Um, there's more like content and more noise. And, and suddenly it feels like, like we can't have consensus on anything anymore, but it's it's just because there's more diversity, more diverse voices that are being elevated into the public sphere, and there are less of these gatekeeping um, mechanisms that we traditionally had. They've been replaced by new ones, but um, it just creates this effect of like there's so much more. Yeah, there's just like so many more opinions out in the open that that used to exist, but just didn't um, have access to those platforms. And Actually, on that exact note of diverse voices in the public sphere, part of this project of the Radical AI podcast is to try to uplift those diverse voices and um, make them a little bit more normalized and well-known. So uh, it would be great for us if you could actually tell us a little bit about, um, first, what you think the word radical means to you and uh, then how you situate yourself in that definition of radical with the work that you do. I think radical to me is always questioning your assumptions. Um, yeah, and I, and I think, I'm, I'm trying to find examples of how I do this in my professional life. I do this a lot in my personal life. Um, so maybe I'll just like draw a metaphor or whatever from my personal life, but like, one thing that I, um, as at the age that I'm at, like all my friends are getting married. Um, and like one of the things that I love doing is just like questioning why marriage as a, as an institution exists and like why people still, like, why is it that the man always still proposes to the woman in most, in most straight marriages? And like, why is it that like the bride is the one that walks down the aisle and, and then like she has her bridesmaids and she's the only one that wears the engagement ring. And like, for me, radical is like not just taking things that have always been to to be like true or like not always just accepting um, what the past is to be like the way forward um, and and like starting from scratch, like sh like what what does marriage actually mean? Um, 
if you want to like have some kind of nice ritual to signify a bond between you and your partner, like does it actually require like a $40,000 ceremony where you wear a white gown and like do all these things? No. Like, (laughs) um, and I think in my work, I guess, like what I'm always thinking about is, I I guess an example of how I'm radical in my job is like, we also have, for example, a really entrenched narrative that, um, technical people do technical things and humanities people do like humanities things. And if you're good at one, you can't be good at the other. And like, it, and it starts really young where like you're told as a kid, like, Oh, you're a math kid or like you're an English kid. And like, I, so I also speak Mandarin and this is also in Mandarin language where people will ask you, Oh, like, are you a humanities person or a tech person when they're trying to get to know you better and like learn about your career And that, the way that I'm, I guess, I approach that narrative radically is to just subvert it. Like, I think it's total bogus that you can't be both. And I try to occupy that space of both um, and constantly challenge the fact that um, you can't do that. Um, Yeah, that was like a really strange (laughs) answer. (laughs) I combined like... My philosophy on marriage and my philosophy on on interdisciplinarity, but you know, hey, that was that, I mean that was our real goal was to get your philosophy on marriage out of this interview. So, um, so I, back 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 in the day, back in my in my college days years ago, uh, I wanted to be an aspiring. I was an aspiring journalist. Uh, not great at my job. There's a reason why I didn't end up doing that. Um, but I think there are a lot of other people that really look up to you in the work that you're doing in AI ethics and in journalism. And I'm wondering if you had uh, one either piece of advice or something that you would like to share with uh, those folks, or maybe just pretend that I'm one of those folks back in my college days. <laughs> um, I think the advice that I, I don't, this, I, this just has nothing to do with AI, um, but I think just in general, one of my guiding philosophies in life is to always be willing to experiment and not be afraid of being a beginner. Um, because like I took like a very circuitous path to where I am now, where I studied engineering and then I was in software and then I was uh, a data scientist for a while and then a journalist. And um, all of that led me to where I am today, but I couldn't have gotten here. I don't think if I had been willing to just like blow everything up and start again. Um, and maybe that's a, that's a broader metaphor for like, <laughs> how we should, how our world should be or something. I don't know. Um, (laughs) but just, I guess that's my advice or how, um, how I would suggest people to navigate, um, their lives is, is to be willing to reset and, um, try something new. Maybe it's a good piece of advice for marriage as well. Who knows? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Blow it all up and start it. Well, Karen, thank you so much for coming on the show today. For our listeners, if there's a place that they uh, could go to engage with some of the awesome uh, visualizations and stories that you've worked on, uh, where's the best place for them to do that? Um, you can go to my website at Karen D, D as in dog, how, dot com. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter at underscore Karen How. Great. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. We want to thank Karen Howe again for coming on the show today and for a wonderful conversation. I'm feeling pretty uh, jazzed after our conversation. Jess, how are you feeling? Yeah, I'm feeling really similar. I was actually going to use the word excited. Uh, I just absolutely love all the projects that Karen is doing. And even just looking at her website briefly, it just makes me so stoked to see this kind of work happening. I'm really, really passionate about trying to explain technical and really like complex AI and machine learning systems to people who don't come from a technical or coding background. And she does it in such a cool way. She just does such a great job of combining media and journalism and storytelling and giving these honestly, these topics that are not really fun to dig into, she makes them just so interesting and entertaining to any kind of audience. And I think that is such an awesome superpower. So I am a very big fan of her work. Yeah, just I think it's really inspirational for us to listen to what Karen's doing, because in a way, that's the work that we're trying to do with this Radical AI podcast, which is to take these complex ideas and systems and 
narratives of artificial intelligence and to try to boil it down into these ethical principles and to figure out, you know, what do we do with this uh, soup <laughs> of AI ethics that we've been given? Uh, and how do we how do we really uh, make it accessible to folks from all sorts of backgrounds and not just the people from the hyper-technical areas? And as someone who does not come from a technical background, uh, I really appreciated Karen's take on how she does her job as a journalist. And I just had so much respect for both her and for the MIT Technology Review for the journalism that they're continuing to do at that intersection between AI ethics and, well, specifically about race and gender and uh, policy and politics and bringing all that together within the, the AI sphere. Um, I just think they're doing an incredible job and it was great to hear um, from the other side of the curtain, right? Because I've read some of Karen's articles before um, about how she thinks about her task as a journalist. And specifically, I mean, something I think a lot about in um, moral philosophy is this concept of truth um, and her take on truth being consensus information. I just find that um, fascinating because I don't know if everyone out in the journalistic sphere would um, agree. And I'm curious if we get another journalist on the show to, to ask and see if we get different concepts of truth and the role of journalism in regards uh, to truth. I think the other takeaway that I had was uh, Karen's reflection on technology being neither good nor evil, but uh, more that moral element is in how it's used and how it's promoted and the social system that it's uh, systems that it's embedded in. And of course, we'll give more of a debrief in our monthly mini-sode, but in the meantime, we want to hear from you. And this week, we have a question that was inspired by our colleague, Karen, who we just interviewed. What do you think the role of journalism is in promoting and reporting on AI ethics? Please share your thoughts with us on Twitter or via email. And for more information on today's show, please visit the episode page at RadicalAI.org. If you enjoyed this episode, we invite you to subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or your favorite podcatcher. Join our conversation on Twitter at RadicalAIPod and... As always, stay, stay radical. radical. Jess, did you like the soup metaphor? Is it good? I, 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 like, I like the soup metaphor. I think everyone's going to really love the soup thing. That's right. If you had an AI ethics soup, what would you put in it, Jess? Uh, fairness. Fairness? <laughs> fairness, Justice, accountability. ethics, transparency. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I'd put was, I'd put, I truth, put, I'd put truth in it. Truth soup. Yeah. Yeah. Truth soup. Yeah. Possibly some carrots. Mm, the, yeah. <laughs>